So winning at work is our title today in our hashtag winning series. In my days, I've come across people who love work. They just love to work. And then I've come across people who just hate to work. They hate to work. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on any of those two. The preponderance of people I've come across, though, they tolerate work. That work is just a means to an end. But what if I told you that your work was more valuable, more critical, and more purposeful than just a means to an end? What if I told you that when you work a certain way for a certain person, all that you've ever needed for work and from work will be given to you? And that's what it means to win at work. So each week, we're all given the same amount of time, every one of us. We're given 168 hours, every one of us. Now, in general sleep patterns, you're going to be awake for 112 of those, 168. And generally, we at least identify the work week in America, whether it's plus or minus. Generally, we identify it as 40 hours, right? So roughly, a little more than a third of our awake hours is going to be spent at work. So doesn't it stand to reason that God would not leave out such a significant percentage of our life just to go and do whatever? God isn't just a two-thirds God. God is a three-thirds God. So what we do, where we do it, how we do it is of significant importance to us. God is all in, everywhere, all the time, and that includes our work. So practically speaking, we work for four different reasons, right? First is needs. We work for our needs, right? So this is food, clothing, shelter, transportation. Well, after needs, we work for upgrades, right? Upgrades. So I've heard one person define upgrades as in three categories, bigger, better, different. Bigger, better, different. So the the first upgrade, we want bigger, or we want a bigger house, or we don't want bigger clothes. That's, that's the wrong direction. But, but we, want, we want more of them, right? So bigger is, you know, the quantity of that. When we get, when we get the bigger side down, then, then sometimes we shift to better. So we want a better car. We want a better quality of clothes. We want a, so better will speak to quality. We're bigger will speak to volume. And then there's, an, there's even another tier of upgrade, and that's different. I want something different than everyone else has. I, I want something exotic, or I, I want something that has a story. So, so that's the bigger, better, different. Now, there's nothing wrong with upgrades. However, upgrades can create this vortex cycle that sucks you in, and it starts impacting your decisions about money as it relates to debt and other things, um, your generosity. And then it starts impacting, actually, your even health, because then you start constantly not being... Con- content with where you are. There's always something else there. So upgrading is not bad unless we get caught into that, that vortex. So, so we work for needs. We work for upgrades. Then we work for identity. All right. Now, you wouldn't come right out and say that your work is your identity. But generally speaking, anybody, especially men, when you get to know one another just a little bit, you know, eight, ten seconds, you, you ask, well, what do you do? Or you even will introduce yourself as, well, I am so-and-so, or I work so-and-so, or I am this profession. And so although we wouldn't come right out and say that we work for identity, our work ends up actually being how we define and introduce ourselves to other people. And then the fourth reason that I've identified is that uh, we work for purpose, that everybody longs for a purpose, everybody. They long to do something that's bigger than themselves. But that's very interesting is the biggest complaint that I ever get from people when they talk about the work is they just don't feel like it's worthwhile. They don't feel like they're accomplishing what they want to accomplish. So, so purpose actually is one reason why we work, but it's also one of the main reasons why we're most discontent in our work is we're not finding purpose in our work. All right? So good topic, right? All right? So here's the deal. When we understand why we're created and that we're created for God's purpose to work, and God's purpose is for us to work, and we know why we're created, when we start knowing what the target is around work, we can hit it. See, when you don't have a target, then you don't know when you're hitting it when you're not hitting it. We're going to start kind of fleshing out this target today. I want to first by debunking three primary work myths, all right? Three primary work myths. Here's the first one. God is not interested in my job. Work myth number one. Here's the truth. God is interested in you. 
So if, if we were knit together in our mother's wombs, if he's known all of our days before any of them been written, wouldn't he be interested in how he has wired you and how you are using that wiring? Doesn't that make sense? That he would be enthralled, interested, intrigued about you and how you've been wired and how you're living that out. Myth, he's not interested in your job. Truth, he's interested in you. Myth number two, my work doesn't matter. It's just a job. Truth number two, your work is worship. Working as worship turns every workplace into a cathedral. And every cathedral changes dark places into light places. Myth number three, at work, I'm all on my own. Truth, our work is in partnership with God. We're never on our own when we're living for God's purposes. You need to get a handle on those myths and those truths, especially the first one, that God's not interested in my job. Look, Genesis 1-2 says, Let there be light, and there was light. God saw that light was good, and he separated it from darkness. The very beginning of Scripture, we have an indication of God's work. This was God's work. It was a creative work. And not only was it a creative work, he recognized that his work was good. That's good work. I mean, I can hear the pause. Wow, that's great light. Nobody could have done light like that. I did light. Then God creates with these words. It's part of his character. It's who God is. He is a creating God. He created with his hands. And he created with his breath. Created with his words. He created the earth with his words. And then he started making animals out of the dirt. He got his hands dirty. God's a get his hands dirty God. And got his hands dirty with you and me. And then he breathes into us. So he breathes his soul. He breathes his DNA. He breathes his spirit into us. So doesn't it stand to reason if God created with, with his words and with his hands and with his breath and he created us and he breathed into us that we are created in his image, the scripture says, male and female like him, that we would be breathed into a creative being, that he has caused us and given us that same creativity. And then in chapter 2, tells us another bit about God's creative ability. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all of their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he'd been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all of this work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating he had done. There was a quality nature to his creation. He called it good. But this is one of the best things I love about God. God finishes what he starts. He completed it. He finished the work. And that's especially important when we go on to read Philippians 1.6. It says, being confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in you will carry it out to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. He didn't just complete that creative work. He completes the creative work that he begins in all of us. So God created a world for mankind to cohabitate with him, to co-create with him, and to co-labor with him. Think about it. Why does God come down in the garden, we read in Genesis, in the cool of the evening? What did he come down to do? He came down to talk with his creation. What do you think they talked about? I mean, was it Eve complaining that Adam didn't pick up his clothes? Why not? They didn't have no clothes. That was Southern, by the way. They, they don't have no clothes. There's three negatives. You can, if you get two, it's a positive. You get three of them, it's still a negative. I knew the linguist over here would like that. No, God was interested, and what did you do today? I've placed you in this garden to co-create with me. What have you been doing? What's the work look like today, Adam? I mean, one of the things that they were given to do was right, name animals. I mean, I can imagine. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching here, right? But I can imagine, hey, what, what, what's that one over there? Oh, God, we named that one platypus. Really? What a great name. Who would have ever thought of platypus? I mean, this is, he coming, because he's enjoying this interaction with Adam and Eve, who's placed in the garden to work it, to create it. 
to work with him along all of that kind of creation. But then sin happened. And when sin happened, sin disrupted man's interaction with God. And it disrupted the joy of that co-creation. One of the consequences of the fall was that this ground that Adam would put his hand to and it would just produce, God said, well, now there's going to be thorns and thistles in that ground. And really what's going to be produced here is the sweat of your brow. And then he looks at man and woman together and says, well, Eve, now the, the way you read it in NIV doesn't carry, the, doesn't carry the punch of this. He says, your desire will be for your husband. When, when you break that out, it's saying, um, you're, you're going to desire to rule your husband. And then he looks at man and he said, but he will rule over you. Now, Two weeks ago, three weeks ago when I preached on marriage, I told you that when Eve was created as a suitable helper, and I said that meant a perfect fit that was co-equal with Adam, and they had this synergistic relationship that they were going to be one. There was no lower or higher. So do you see how now that this is a curse? So before any man stands up and goes, yeah, I rule over my wife, remember it was a curse. Curse. That there would be this struggle and fight. Welcome to our world right now, right? There would be a struggle. Ladies, the most creative thing that God built into your DNA was having children. Now, not everybody has children. But that's a creative bit of DNA. And yet now it's going to be excruciatingly painful. And where there was going to be no death, now there was going to be death. And the very earth that was created, we were created from, that was going to be the place we were going to return And that was the curse of sin. That messed up all this co-creating. But the curse of sin did not come without a promise. The promise was, I'm going to send someone to redeem all of that. So now, I can love my wife as Christ loved the church. And now she can honor and respect me. And we're not fighting with one another of who dominates rules over one another. We're one. We'd be fighting with ourselves. That's the beauty of what the cross brings. Now, with work, in the same manner, God redeems work. And the redemption of work is what we can get a hold of, of how he's redeemed work with us, co-creating with him. This is where joy will start to come back. So I want to look at three new ways to work at, to look at work post-cross. Okay? The first says, you were created to co-create. You were created to co-create. Martin Luther said this, God hasn't stopped creating. He continues to create through you and me. So I'm not the one inventing this. We can go back to Martin Luther and he understood this. The first time I heard this concept, I balked. I was at a post-grad class in New Jersey. And what I realized is in New Jersey, you can act like New Jersey and it just blends in. And so it's okay. And I was kind of a little ticked off about it. I said, what do you want to co-create with God? I don't co-create with God. God creates stuff out of nothing. We don't create anything. The best we can do is make something, not create something. So I kind of got on the side and said, you're going, to help, you're going to have to help me with this. How do we co-create with God? And he said, Charlie, God has resurrected you. He's put his power and his spirit in you. You've been chosen to do this. He, he, you guys work together on this. You co-create together. He's excited to do this work with you. And then you read in the Old Testament, and then we read these passages that use these exact words. It says, God gifted And when you read in the Old Testament, God's gifted people for craftsmanship. You can read as God gifts for arts. God's gifted for leadership. It's in there. God gifted. The the birthplace and the bents and the giftings, they happen in even in your mother's womb. And then you listen to what Paul's words were to the church at Ephesus. This is out of the message. It says, now God has us where he wants us. See, all of our days were known before they ever were lived. So God has us right where he wants us with all the time in this world and the next to shower grace and kindness upon us in Christ Jesus. Saving is all his idea and all his work. All we do is trust him enough to let him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. We don't play the major role. If we did, we'd probably go around bragging that we'd done the whole thing. No, we neither make nor save ourselves. God does both the making and the saving. And here's... Here's the hammer. He creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join him in the work he does, the good work he has gotten ready for us to do, work we'd better get doing. 
co-creating with God, with work, his work that he's designed for us to do. But the big hurdle with that becomes a fourth myth that I could put in, and that there's a myth between something called the sacred and the secular, that possibly you would define what I do as sacred work and what maybe you do as secular work, right? Because we would say that how can making a widget or selling a widget or advertising for a widget or how can any of that be considered sacred? Well, the difference between sacred and secular is probably not as big as you've ever even imagined. What is the title of the prime minister in England? What what is her title? I just told you. What is the title of the leader? Let me start again. Let's erase that. Disregard, jury. What the? It's well. There's no getting back from that, is there? So, 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 prime minister, and, and generally, most most government structures touched by Great Britain have ministers. So you have a minister of defense and a minister of education, minister of health. So what does minister mean? It means leader. So there's a mix. How about vocation? Anytime you use the word vocation, you talk about what you end up doing. But there's a, the Latin root for vocation means to be called. It means we are called. So even when you look in your dictionary under vocation, it's not until you get to the third definition does it say job or occupation? Now, here's another one. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. And that word means to be called out. So isn't it interesting that we put this false dichotomy between what's sacred and what's secular? In fact, I would say what makes the difference is who we work for, the product that we are producing in our labor, Because when you do something for the Lord, it produces far more than just a widget. Who we work for, why we work, and how we work is what determines sacred. And I believe it puts us in a position to win at work. Here's the second concept I want us to break down. We'll play a little Wheel of Fortune. Um, Seven-letter word, beginning with W, has an S as the fourth letter, and it's a phrase... Blank while you work. It's actually worship, but I really wanted to hear all of, all of that. Because it's wor- worship is seven letters. Whistle seven letters. Starts with a W, fourth letter S. You can't make this stuff up. Worship while you work. If we worship while I work, it changes our concept and perception about work. Listen to Colossians out of the Amplified. Whatever you do, no matter what it is, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And in dependence on him, give thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever you do, whatever your task may be, work from the soul. That is what put you, what that, that is, put in your very best effort as something done for the Lord and not for men. Knowing with all certainty that it is from the Lord, not from men, that you will receive the inheritance which is your greatest reward. It is the Lord Christ whom you actually serve. That's worship. When I understand that I don't work for X, Y, Z, I work for the Lord. I saw my mom demonstrate this. My mom was a professional woman in an era where it wasn't easy to be a professional woman. I understand it's not easy now, but go back a couple of decades. And she succeeded, I believe, wholeheartedly because she worshiped at work. Now, what does that mean? Did she sing on the way into work? My mom hated singing. She would have thought the first 30 minutes of her service was a complete waste of time. She wanted to get to someone to open up the Bible and teaching. That was my mom. She wasn't singing. So did she bring her Bible and place it on her desk? Not that I ever saw. Did she get up three times a day and go in another room and pray? Not that I ever knew. But I knew that she was always praying and always working for the right person. Whether it's your dream job, a temp job, a bridge job, an entry-level job, your worship is what determines your winning. Favorite verse of scripture in terms of what I've based so much of my life on comes out of Matthew 6. So seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now here's where English also lets us down. Seek first the kingdom looks like I'm going to look for it. And actually what it means is establish the kingdom. Bring the kingdom. Bring forth the kingdom first. And all these other things will be added unto you. Matthew 6 identifies those other things. 
talks about food and clothing, some of his needs. And in fact, the way Matthew labels it, or in Jesus' words, he says, listen, the pagans run after those things. That, that's their primary concern. That's why they work. They run after all those things. But listen, make my work your work. If my work's your work, then these other things that everybody else chases as the primary things, hey, listen, they get, they get thrown in as a bonus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. It matters how we spend this one-third of our life. When it's God's purposes, when we worship him in our work, things change. How do they change? Well, here's that third piece. I called it light up the place. Light up the place. Because when you turn your work into a cathedral, it's light. Listen, listen how this begins out of the message. Get out of bed, Jerusalem. What great four words. Isaiah is the messianic prophet. He's talking about Jesus is coming. Get out of bed, Jerusalem. Wake up. Put your face in the sunlight. God's bright glory has risen for you. The whole earth is wrapped in darkness. All people sunk in the deep darkness. But God rises over you. His sunrise glory breaks over you. Nations will come to your light. Kings to your sunburst brightness. Look up. Look around. Watch as they gather. Watch as they approach you. Your son's coming from great distances. Your daughter's carried by their nannies. When you see them coming, you'll smile big smiles. Your heart will swell and, yes, burst. All those people returning by sea for the reunion, a rich harvest of exiles gathered for in from the nations, and then streams of camels and caravans as far as the eye can see, young camels of nomads in Midian and Ephah, pouring in from the south from Sheba, loaded with gold and frankincense, preaching the praises of God, and yes, a great roundup of flocks from the nomads, and Kedar and Nebeth. Welcome gifts for worship at my altar as I bathe in my glorious temple in splendor. What's... What's the prophet saying? When the light of Christ comes, people come from all over the place to see this light. About 30 years ago, there was a missiologist um, and evangelist, Louise Bush. And Louise Bush um, coined a phrase called the 1040 window. Some are familiar, some are. 10 degrees latitude to 40 degrees latitude above the equator stretch out across the world. And in that 1040 window the most challenging social economic conditions that we've ever seen or known. The least access there is to the gospel, that people can be born, raised, live, die, and never once have access to the gospel or hear the name Jesus, ever. No, no coincidence, it's the birthplace and the strongest footholds for Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism. Okay? Dark. And then about 20 years ago, a man came along by the name of Oz Hillman, and Oz Hillman identified another window. He called it the 9 to 5 window. Our traditional American work day, I know it's different, it changes, but right from an from a anecdotal standpoint, 9 to 5, and he said, ah, in, in America, that may be the darkest place, our 9 to 5 window. So let's do something for a minute. Turn out all the lights. Take, take out all the lights. All right. So... What you see now is darkness, right? We're in darkness. All right, now if you can find your phone, reach to your phone, turn your flashlight on. All right, now what do you see? I heard someone say lights. All right, I want you to know something. Darkness is singular. Lights is plural. There's always just dark, darkness. There's always just darkness. Ah, but then there are lights. Darkness never infringes upon light. Light always infringes on darkness. Light is never impacted by darkness. Darkness is always impacted by light. Then you turn the lights back on. So you can see that if I worship at my work, I'm going to light up the place. If I'm not working for X, Y, Z, but I'm working for the Lord, I'm going to light up the place. And it's going to change who I am, what I do, and how I do it. There are three C's of hiring. This is at least what I've heard. I try to, try to go by these as well. Character, chemistry, and competency. Three C's of hiring. Now, competency, what I've learned, might get you the job. But character is what allows you to keep the job. 
Here are a couple quotes. This one's General Norman Schwarzkopf. Some of you are too young to remember. Uh, Desert Storm. He was our commander in Desert Storm. He said, leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character, but if you must be without one, be without strategy. The context of who said that is significant. Christian business leader turned author Max Dupree, author of Leadership as an Art, said this, The first responsibility of a leader is to define reality. The last is to say thank you, and in between, the leader is a servant. And maybe my all-time favorite quote of leadership comes from actually Napoleon. He says, A leader is a dealer in hope. Now the question we have is how are we leading at work? Is it serving? Are we dealing hope? Do we have the character to match? It's a great challenge. If you want your work to count more than the widget and the salary, determine who you're working for, how you're going to work, why you work. The what is always going to be based on how God's wired us and gifted us. It doesn't make anybody's job or career more significant than the others. It's what we do there that counts. So, I always try to um, filter my sermons on how would this impact me? Because it does impact me when I preach it. (laughs) My first thought was, I wrote it this way, good grief, Pastor Charlie. I had a hard enough job living up to my expectations at work, and now you're telling me there are more. And actually, what I want you to hear is that's not what I'm teaching you at all. What I'm teaching you is that your work matters more than you probably thought it did. But myth number three is just that. You never go to work alone. This week I had lunch with a businessman, and his job is to clean up other people's messes. They hire his company to come in when when another company that had been hired made a mess. So he's going into something that wasn't his mess. He doesn't even know how it got to be that mess. But his job is to figure out how that mess got there and how to clean up that mess. We're having lunch. He said, Charlie, I consider wisdom the low-hanging fruit of leadership. And I said, it is. Let me tell you why. Here's James 1, 2 through 5. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Come on up, Chris. That's why I define it as low-hanging fruit. It's low-hanging fruit because he's promised to answer this prayer to anyone and listen and answer it generously. Here's, Here's what I think this means. There are many times I don't even know what I'm asking God for in prayer because I haven't fully been able to define what the problem is I'm looking for wisdom over, Right? That's, that's, part of the, that's part of what's driving us to prayer for wisdom is because we don't have a complete understanding of what we even need or what it is. So God doesn't answer my prayer based on, and that's why sometimes I try not to be specific in prayer. Now, I, I get there's times to be specific, but if he only answers what I ask for, I don't know what I'm asking for. So when it says that he gives generously, when I go to him and ask for wisdom, this, his generosity is, hey, look, Charlie, let me teach you a little something here because this is something you don't see yet, but this is something that's coming. Or I know this solution. You know why we balk at God's solutions is because they don't make sense to us. Why did we pray? Because we have no sense, right? I mean, we don't have enough sense to deal with the issue, so we pray. Then God gives us an approach or an answer that's something we couldn't have dreamed or thought of, but we're afraid to take it because it doesn't make sense. But we've asked for wisdom because wisdom is how we do things, not just what we do, and it gives us generously to this. So I'm not teaching you that there's um, a higher expectation at work. I'm teaching you the fact that your work matters. It matters more than you would ever dreamed. And God is with you in that one-third of your life, just like he is with the other two-thirds. And if you're worried about your work is not producing enough, what you want to see is tangible results, change it to worship and watch it change. Watch it change. Because well, when you turn that place into cathedral, listen, I've been all over the world. I've seen some of the prettiest churches and cathedrals in the darkest places all over Western Europe, Eastern Europe. A town could be impoverished to the hill, but that Eastern uh, European cathedral is going to be opulent. And you know what I've noticed? 
it's always noticed. Even in the darkest places, a cathedral gets noticed. You become a cathedral. And watch yourself get noticed. So that you can be noticed? No, so we can reflect God. Two years ago, I preached a message on work, which tells me I probably got to teach it more often than just once every two years. In that, I wrote a prayer. I called it our Take God to Work on Monday prayer. And I want to give it to you today. It says, Lord, I work for you. I submit myself to your leadership. Equip me for the work you have ahead of me and polish me to be an accurate reflection of you. I want people to see you and me. I invite you to interject, interrupt, intercede, and intervene anywhere and in any way you see fit. Amen. I invite God to your work. Learn some version of that prayer. All these slides will be up on the website by Wednesday. Winning at work is not defined by your position or your pay or your current production. Winning at work is defined by who you worship and how you worship. The position, the pay, the production, the needs, the upgrades, they'll, they'll come along. Whatever we need will come along. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Here's how I want to end. If you find yourself in a position at work, either, listen, either you're out of work, you are frustrated and dissatisfied with work. You're facing something that's beyond you at work. If any of those apply to you, I want you to stand up. Dissatisfied at work. I'm out of work. I'm looking for new work. I don't find enough purpose in work. The work is beyond me right now. I need solutions work. Is that it? The rest of you just shy. There we go. I want to pray for you. Listen. Is there a next job for you? Very well could be. But that's not the most important job to you right now. It's the one you're at. You worship there. God will move you. Listen, if God's not moving you, look around. There's still more work he has for you there. I'm convinced that anytime we submit our paths to the Lord, the Lord will always make sure we follow his path. We get a lot of angst. We get a lot of angst over, over am I making the right choice? You, you want to follow God, he will continue to circle you back until he gets you in the right path. So, Father, I pray right now for the men and women standing. Lord, it was a broad call, so, Lord, as they offer up their very specific prayer to you, Lord, I pray that you would answer their prayer on Monday. Lord, not as a gimmick, but such a plain illustration to them that when we pray about work, you answer. Guide and direct their steps. Lord, protect them. And protect their heart. Lord, I pray that you protect their heart more than you protect their job. Their heart is the most important. Thank you, Father. Amen. Everyone stand for the benediction. Winning at work. I like to say this was my favorite message in this series, but I've liked them all. I've liked them all. Here, for over, probably close to 500 times, I've given the same benediction. I'm going to read you a different benediction out of, out of Hebrews 13, 20, and 21 today. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Enjoy your Sunday afternoon.